Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome to another hour dedicated to inquiry, reflection, questions, possibilities, philosophical conundrums, and a whole lot more, all in our effort to understand exactly what enlightenment means and what it is to be enlightened. Indeed, an hour dedicated to learning something more about ourselves, an hour designed to help us go further inward and perhaps challenge some of those old ideas about the world we live in and the people we have become. This is an hour for the open-minded, for where our search might take us may provoke a level of insight that may just perturb our notions of what is real, what is valuable, what is truth, and more. It is therefore an hour where we admit that our foregone conclusions could all be wrong, and in that way, truly open ourselves up to the possibility of a new kind of understanding that in some way, somehow, may indeed lead to that elusive state known as enlightenment. All right, now every week I read a few of your letters as our way of paying homage to the importance you play in helping us to shape our show and make it even better in every way. Last week our guest was Hoska Harrison. Laura wrote, Eldon, I love your show, I love your guests, I love thinking about things in different ways and accept that sometimes there is no concrete answer. I have read many of the books from your guests. One of the books I enjoyed was from your guest, Hoska Harrison. I am not sure that I would have known to pick it up without your radio program. I was, however, disappointed today when you didn't have enough time to discuss the subliminal messages that started in 2009. Did I get that right? Can you give me a little more detail on this? Well, many of you had the same question, so I dropped Hosk an email, and this was his answer. Hello, Eldon. I'm still in Greece and getting ready to travel to Egypt in a couple of days. My email is very sporadic. I can send you a little more involved answer when I return on or about April 1st. The subliminal messages are strong in Greece. The EU, European uh, Union, is using financial forcing to write and change the laws for Greece without Greece having a say-so in their new laws. There is some resistance, but nothing like it would have been a few years ago. A campaign of subliminal influence started last fall and is continuing in the United States, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and Australia. With love and light, Hoska. Okay, now that's a pretty good teaser. So we immediately went back to Hoska, and we have him coming back to the show to discuss just this subject. All right, Peggy wrote, Love your show. I like how you challenge people and are not afraid to. I particularly like today's show, March 16th, on channeling. I love listening to Esther Hicks and Abraham, and for the first time heard Hoska Harrison and Jonah today. I am very interested in the communication with the other side and how the mind can change our lives. Hey House Radio has changed my life. Thanks to all the authors. I hope you stay. Melody wrote, Dear Eldon, thank you so much for these free gifts you offer. I am a mother of three and need all the help I can get on proper parenting, as they are a source of great struggle for me at times. If you could possibly do a show on Hay House Radio for parenting, how to handle back talk, uncooperativeness, etc., that would be greatly appreciated. I love, love your show on Hay House. Today's topic with Hoska Harrison was fabulous. Thanks so much again for all you do. Well, once again, our listening audience has set an agenda for our show. Uh, we will schedule a parenting expert. Indeed, I think we have that parenting expert pretty well set right now in the very near future. So stay tuned for your sh- what I guess is your show, Melody. We'll all be in that. I think we all experience that. i got a 16-year-old boy. I have a 16-year-old boy uh, and an 11-year-old son. And the two of them, uh, I understand what you mean about back talk and uncooperativeness. All right, now L.R. wrote, I really enjoy your thought-provoking show on Hay House Radio, and I'm so glad that you're on. I like the fact that you're not afraid to push the envelope in terms of subject matter. It is true; It truly is inspiring. I'm also astounded by the body of work you've produced over the years. As a person on low disability income, I really appreciate the fact that you have made some of it available for free. Thank you so much. Now, for those of you tuning in for the first time, what Melody and L.R. are speaking about is my own way of paying it forward. Uh, I make available a number of recorded programs at no cost on CD and or MP3. You can download the MP3s by going to my site, eldentaylor.com, and following the link under free programs. 
These are not samples. They are the real deal. This is the patented and scientifically proven, and I mean dozens of double-blind studies. And that's what I mean by scientifically proven, effective intertalk technology. This is the product that we sell for $27.95 each. There are titles there to deal with everything from stress to loss of a loved one. Now, if you decide you want the CD, it is free as well, but there is a shipping charge. That said, you can download the MP3 of the same program absolutely free. And again, this is just our way of paying it forward. Okay, last week we spent some time discussing a new pet charity of mine, and that is Women for Afghan Women. And I would invite you once again to check out the work of this group by going to their website, womenforafghanwomen.org. I introduced this charity on the back of a letter that came uh, essentially stating that there is no good or bad, no evil, for everything is culturally relevant. What's right in one culture is not necessarily right in another. I made the point that in my way of thinking, for a Taliban leader to cut the nose and ears from his new 14-year-old bride because she did not please him, an actual incident that brought my attention to the charity I spoke of earlier, as simply an evil act. We received several emails on this issue, including one that chastised me for comparing the wrong a group can do to that done to the Jewish people during World War II. All right, Lisa wrote, just heard a rebroadcast and wanted to clarify a point, which is that there is no source, capitalized, of evil or wrongness, etc. There are always things wanted and unwanted by every sentient being. You are saying that anything undertaken to purposely harm another is evil or wrong. It seems to depend on what one's definition of evil is. Is a dominatrix evil or wrong? Is a little kid who bonks his little sister on the head out of jealousy evil or wrong? Definitions, definitions, death by a thousand qualifications. Well, what? Yes, in my view, when someone acts out of jealousy and deliberately hurts another, the act is wrong. What's more, the right action, in my opinion, requires teaching the wrongness of this sort of behavior. I do not believe the world will ever find peace if we fail to find agreement on basic human rights. The world, as a whole, recognized this as well at one time in our history, which is why the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 217A3 was adopted and proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on December 10, 1948, and importantly was signed by nearly every country, including Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, China, Pakistan, Syria, Philippines, and on and on. Okay. Ruben wrote, I definitely agree with your opinions. Personally, I believe there is an independent force behind evil, and anyone who believes in God would agree with that. If there is a force for good, there is also a force for evil. Logical. Your sharing of your wisdom is appreciated. Denise wrote, I agree 1,000% that all we need to do is help one another. Everything comes after that. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. How simple and how difficult. All other rituals liturgies, etc., are superfluous. It is all about kindness and decency and giving and receiving. Thanks for your giving and receiving, Eldon. You have all heard me say repeatedly, in my books, on this station, in my workshops, and so forth, service is our purpose. Our guest today puts it this way in his book, Power Versus Force, quote, if our lives are dedicated, for instance, to enhancing the welfare of everyone we contact, our lives can never lose meaning. I love this man's spiritual message, and you will too. Okay, Linda wrote, I love the work of Eldon Taylor. What he teaches to people is real enlightenment and through example. His sharing with the other people he has come across in his life to help us choose is marvelous. Well, thank you, Linda. Frank wrote, I have been reading your books and listening to your subliminal CD on my way to work, and it has dramatically helped improve my life. Someone very near and dear to me recently passed away, and your books and CD have helped me to make it through this very difficult time. Thank you for all the good work you do. I am grateful that you are out there helping people through sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you, Frank. And all of us here wish you the very, very best in this difficult time. 
and for that matter, the very, very best, period. Full stop, as they say in the U.K. Now, Danny wrote, I want to thank you for your radio show with Hay House. I have never felt moved to write in before, though I do enjoy this radio station, but the quality of your show is so great that I wanted to give my special appreciation. Many hosts spend much of their show promoting their products, and though I understand that hosts aren't paid for the show and can use their time as they wish, this self-promotion can be tedious. Your shows, on the other hand, are extremely well-prepared and are geared toward listeners with great stimulating guests and hot topics that unfailingly provoke deeper thought and debate. So thank you for all your efforts and keep it coming. Wow. Danny, thank you. And we'll do our best to bring your solid, provocative programming today and in the future. That's all the time we have for today, at least for today, for our letters. But I do want you to know that I do love reading your comments and feedback. I invite you to opine by leaving comments on my website, eldentaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook. As you saw today, your letters can shape the shows that we have. Make your suggestions. If the, if the suggestion fits with what we're about, we'll certainly bring it to the air. It can be spiritually difficult dealing with young people, so that is definitely perhaps a subject for provocative enlightenment. All right, let's get to today's subject. My newsletter emailed today, and by the way, if you have not signed up for it, please do so. It's absolutely free. The title of the feature article is, It's All a Simulation. The topic is based on the work of Nick Bostrom, an Oxford professor of philosophy, who theorized that the possibility that some very advanced civilization might create a simulation with intelligent beings, albeit artificial intelligence, and inhabited this simulation. Now, when you consider the real possibility of being yourself in a simulation, such as the movie Matrix, which was actually inspired by the work of Bostrom, the question that arises first in my mind goes like this. Suppose I discovered that I was an artificial being possessing artificial intelligence in a simulated world created by some grand organizing designer, G-O-D. What would I do? Would I do anything differently? In other words, what would I change? How would I view the entire matter of morality, good and evil, and so forth? What would my priorities become? Our species is wired to receive a natural reward when we help one another. Studies have repeatedly demonstrated that going to the aid of another gives rise to a veritable bath of good-feeling neurochemicals. When I consider the possibility that this is all just a simulation and ask myself, what would I do differently? I realize that so long as I dedicate my life to helping others, it doesn't much matter in a pragmatic sense whether it's a simulation or not. However, there are those that would seize the opportunity to maximize their pleasure in whatever way they could, or so say some of the more fundamentalist arguments. What are your thoughts? If it were all just a simulation, what would you do? What would you believe? How would your life be different? Think about the rules, the commandments, the admonishments, and all the parameters that you might currently live by. Would anything change? It might just be a simulation. If there is a simulation of this type anywhere, scholars agree that it is more likely that we are living the simulation than that we would be the ones to create such a simulation. I wonder, will a simulation within a simulation ever be built? Or perhaps has it already been done? Values, power, force, control, virtue, honesty. Our guest today has investigated the hidden determinants behind human behavior and no doubt can cast some light on what one might do if they actually learned that this was just an illusion, a simulation. We'll talk about all of this today. All right, let's get to today's guest. Dr. David R. Hawkins is a renowned psychiatrist who had the largest psychiatric practice in the United States. He is a physician, researcher, and lecturer, and he co-authored Orthomolecular Psychiatry with Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. Dr. Hawkins has conferred with foreign governments on international diplomacy and has been instrumental in resolving long-standing conflicts that were major threats to world peace. He is the author of the best-selling trilogy, Power Versus Force, 
published in 17 languages. The Eye of the Eye, and that's E-Y-E, the Eye, I love that one. And I, Reality and Subjectivity, as well as three additional books, Truth versus Falsehood, Transcending the Levels of Consciousness, and Discovery of the Presence of God. It is an honor and a real pleasure to have him join us today. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. David R. Hawkins. Thank you for inviting me to be a guest on your program. It sounds certainly very interesting. Well, it's indeed our pleasure. <laughs> to begin with, Dr. Hawkins, can, you know, for our audience's sake, those that may not have read your work, please provide a little background on how a classically trained scientist, yourself, became a voice for the spiritual side of life. Well, it, <clears throat> it came about as a transformational inner experience. I myself uh, had a fatal uh, progressive illness, and uh, I gave up on uh, all the worldly um, techniques and curative uh, designs and medicine and psychiatry and gave up on everything. And I went into my inner self looking for answers and asking God if there was one, asking God if there was one to, to lead me to the resolution. And... Uh, and then the most profound experiences that began to happen. I had had a profound experience early in life in which, uh, in which I experienced uh, an infinite presence beyond all description. I was, uh, I, 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 was a, I, had a, I was a paper boy. I was out on the highway. It was extremely cold and windy, and I dug a hole in the snowbank to get away from the wind. So I went inside of this little cave just to escape the icy wind. And all of a sudden, a, a profound sense of infinite love, infinite peace, foreverness uh, occurred. And I realized that that which I am is all that there is and all there ever was. And that I was, infinite love was the core of my reality. So I guess in come more common terminology, I experienced the self with a capital S as my reality rather than the self with a small s, the psychological self. The presence of God revealed itself spontaneously and uh, then recurred later in life. Uh, additional stresses arose and, uh, and the, the same uh, revelation would occur completely transformative and uh, so those those experiences were very uh, profound so from the very beginning as a child these experiences guided you and you then what decided to practice medicine and and uh, earned your MD and your PhD so you could help people I'm filling in spaces here but please help me out yes I always had the uh the desire to be of assistance to other living creatures, whether it was gardens or animals or people, uh, to try and be uh, as kind as I could to all of life and all of its expressions. And uh, that became a way, a way of life. And uh, so when I had an apartment in New York City, I had my rounds I would make in the city. I would read all the doormen and all the apartment buildings and go to the same stores, and I seem to be followed by a, a sense of uh, a sense of lovingness that uh, was appreciated by other people. They would all remark about it, and I re so I realized just just to be as loving as you can be to all that exists is, is really the best way to exist in this world. <laughs> You're a remarkable human being. I love your spiritual message. In the setup piece, you, you heard me mention last week's show on the letters regarding good and bad. You refer to this dichotomy as power versus force. One strengthens us and one weakens us. Please elaborate on that. That um, truth, that which is truthful and that which is loving, uh, strength actually strengthens the physical body. Of course, it has neurohumoral effects on the brain, uh, the brain neuro neurochemicals that are released by love are completely different than those that are released by hatred or fear. Mm -hmm. 
So to be in the optimal state of mind at all times benefits everyone, every living thing around you, and it also benefits your own brain physiology, and it influences other people around you. So a loving being tends to bring forth a positive brain uh, chemical effect on the people that you interact with. So people look forward to seeing you, and uh, when they when you they see you making your rounds, they all brighten up and feel good. <laughs> so love equals power. <laughs> yeah, power, power is the uh, so power. Love is power, and uh, infinite love is infinite power. And force is anger, animosity, greed. Yes, force is coercion. Force is coercion, trying to influence other people by forcing them to do things. Okay, so I got a tough one for you, Doc. Instead of attracting attracting them by goodness, you know, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've got a good one here for you now. We always like to put, put you know, our guests on the hot seat at least once, all right? <laughs> Not an unfair question, straight up. On page 141 of your book, you address something you call imitators. Your illustration is that of Nazi Germany. You say the Third Reich sold a false patriotism, small p, and this is an example of the imitators. Now, the war ended the dreams of Hitler, okay? So does that mean, according to your definition, that the efforts of the Allies, were they operating from power or from force or from both? They were operating from both. They were were up against survival. Mm -hmm. So survival, of course, brings up uh, for us, and uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the West stood for freedom and enlightenment and God and goodness, so it also had power. And of course, I always use as example uh, uh, power was the example of Mahatma Gandhi. So Mahatma Gandhi did not try to defeat the British militarily. Instead, he became such an overwhelming figure that he dominated their society. So Mahatma Gandhi, who calibrated at 700, I think. So, yes, I think he calibrated at 700. Unconditionally loving uh, represented power, and uh, the British Empire represented force. Yes. Okay. When we come back, we've got a commercial coming up on us, a hard break that we have to take. When we come back, I want to get to this calibration system for those in our audience that are unaware of, of how you calibrate it. But I also want to discuss with you, I think, the, the, the one thing that, that kind of bothered me in all the books that you've written. There's one thing that kind of stuck in my, you know, I guess in the scientist of me, and I'm going to ask you about that, and that's applied kinesiology. In the betwixt time, for all of you listening to us, uh, check out uh, Dr. David R. Hawkins. Uh, his website is Veritas, V-E-R-I-T-A-S, public, uh, publications, P-U-B, just V-E-R-I-T-A-S, P-U-B, dot com. All right, you're listening to Provocative Enlightenment on A House Radio. My guest today is Dr. David Hawkins. We're discussing his work and ideas regarding power and force. Uh, be sure to check out his best-selling trilogy. Uh, we'll be right back after these words from some of our friends. Close your eyes. Imagine your goals and dreams. What's preventing you from accomplishing them? Most often, we are our own worst enemies. I can't. I'm not good enough. It's time to reprogram that inner dialogue. Replace all those negative self-images with, I'm good. I am powerful. I can do anything. Eldon Taylor's Inner Talk patented subliminal technology does just that. Researched at numerous universities such as Stanford and by governments such as Mexico and Germany, InnerTalk has repeatedly been proven effective at changing your self-talk. Stop imagining your goals and make them a reality today. Visit www.innertalk.com. That's I-N-N-E-R-T-A-L-K dot com. InnerTalk dot com. Do you feel like you've become lost in a funhouse? Only seeing the reflection of yourself, 
past, future, and present, but unable to find the real you, I invite you to step through the doorway and onto the path leading to understanding of your mind, your choices, and the influences that surround you. Read Elton Taylor's New York Times best-selling book, Choices and Illusions, now expanded, updated, and revised. It will provide you with real-life examples of how you can break free from your current perceptions and begin your journey to how high is up. Get your copy today from all bookstores or online from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, I'm Dr. Eldon Taylor, and we're discussing... Uh, a, a form of non-duality. I, I guess we haven't quite got there, but we're discussing the work, the, the life work of Dr. David R. Hawkins, particularly his first uh, important book, Power Versus Force, an important book to our conversation or germane to our conversation. Before the break, I suggested I was going to ask uh, Dr. Hawkins very specifically about applied kinesiology. So Dr. Hawkins, here goes. In your book, you base the science on muscle testing. Now, this is something I researched, and my findings strongly suggested that the outcome is all too easily swayed by the desire of the subject. In fact, I did this with law enforcement officers and, and demonstrated clearly that if, if their intention was to give a reading of a certain kind, that's exactly what they would get. Their, the strength in their arm under muscle testing would, would increase or decrease based on my suggestion as well. So your critics have challenged this aspect of your work. I, I know, I, I, I mean, uh, anyone that does the research is going to come across the skeptical definitions and some of the other stuff that's out there that's on anybody that does anything worthwhile. So... My question is this, what safeguards did you apply to guard against fraud? Or did it really matter, considering that this was all about spirituality? Oh, you want to know about the objectivity of applied kinesiology? Yeah, more or less. So, you know, (laughs) the capacity to be objective is a requirement. And, of course, that does limit it, because lots of people can't be uh, purely objective. Uh, because they're so strongly committed to the answer that they desire. Therefore, it's of limited use because people who are, can be detached and be, uh, you know, scientifically aligned with wanting to know the truth for its own sake is uh, is limited. So I always tell people, uh, don't start with uh, things that you have a, a big investment in, uh, an emotional or belief uh, system investment. Uh, try it with um, very simple things, you know, like what's written on the other side of a piece of paper or something like that. So don't start out, you know, with politics or belief systems about God and all that. Uh, to be detached, uh, to be detached and objective requires an inner discipline, and not everybody is capable of that. In fact, it's pretty limited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's pretty limited for people to be objective. So I tell them, here's what you do. You write out the options on a piece of paper, and you mix up the piece of paper with other pieces of paper. And then you use your partner's arm and say what's written on this paper is true, or and, and if, if, you, if, you, if their arm goes strong, then what's written on that paper. So that way you can remain objective because you don't know what the question is. So... Uh, that's a good way to start with it. Is, uh, so you just kind of you kind of double blind it. You double blind it so you don't know what the answer is, and then you also find out how good you are at being objective. So some people are very adept, you know, very adept, and like any other skill, uh, from brain surgery to psychotherapy, you know, some people really have it and other people don't. So it's okay, a limit. It's, you know, the other thing we found out is that people who are atheists. Uh, are unable to use it. People are well, atheists; they can't use kinesiology. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to experiment with that one. But now you've developed a those numerical deny, system. Those who deny the, the source and the basis and the essence of truth, which is to 
divinity are not karmically allowed to benefit by the fruits of it. I say, yeah. That's the only well, reason I can get on it. <laughs> now, now you, you, you've got two questions. We've got callers and we've got questions out of the chat room, but you push two buttons on me I've got to go to. The first one is... Uh, you essentially assert, flatly assert, that the collective unconscious is accessible to all of us through the un- our, our own unconscious, subconscious. Yeah. And that when we answer these things, known or unknown to us, we're really tapping into that. Is that correct? That, that's, in a, as a generality, you know, Carl Jung described the collective unconscious. And... Um, so we, we tap into the collective unconscious uh, intuitively and also using kinesiology, yep. So you, now you're going to say that any, anyone, everyone, uh, except the atheist, has that ability? No, I didn't say everyone. It's actually quite limited. The, the tapping into the collective is quite limited? <clears throat> everyone is influenced by it and is connected with it. Okay. All right, on page 227 of Power Versus Force, you state, We may think of the collective unconscious as a vast hidden database of human awareness. The great promise of the database is its capacity to know virtually anything the moment it's asked, for it's able to tap into, for it's, it is able to tap into all that has ever been experienced anywhere in time. Yeah. And, Okay, but what you're saying, you're clarifying that by saying there are just a few that can do this? Well, the the number of people in our society who can be detachedly objective is probably quite limited, you know. Okay, that's probably true. All right, I'll take that one. Let me me get the second part so we can get to our callers in our chat room. Uh, So that everybody understands, uh, you use a calibration system uh, for different levels of consciousness. Uh, all of these levels uh, you you believe can be tested for truth, and they're numerically calibrated through your muscle testing that we've been discussing. And you yeah. use a log a logarithmic scale of one to a thousand. Yeah. Now, if I understand correctly, any person, concept, thought, or object that calibrates, I believe it's at two hundred, the point of integrity or above is positive, is power. Yeah. And anything below that is negative or force. That's correct. Please ex- explain how you derive this scale. Oh, uh, empirically. Yeah, empirically means uh, by trial and error like any other, uh, you know, most of the science is nothing but experimental, uh, 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 an accumulation of experimental, experimental data uh, until uh, something consistent comes out, and then you test to see if that is always going to be that way. But doesn't that invoke a value judgment? No. It's just, uh, you know, if you mix uh, sodium and chloride, you get salt or not. But if you say good and bad, you've invoked a value judgment. Yeah, it's good so, and bad or, or, or value judgment, yeah. So, but my point is then, when you test a word uh, and but, you but, see empirically that it consistently scores under 200, your value judgment has impinged upon the scoring of that word. There isn't any value judgment, see. Okay, well, I think let's, let's go or, to our phones. That thing is false or true. Uh, That's not a value uh, judgment. It's just a scientific observation, you know. If you go in this uh, direction, it'll get you to Chicago, and if you go in this direction, it won't. <laughs> well, philosophically, you, you, you and I could it's spend the next hour on that one. It's not a philosophic uh, be- question. Well, I think it is. Uh, if I know, go truth- north, I'll, I'll be in Chicago, and if I go south, one of those answers is going to be correct. Well, that that may be true, but there would be a whole world that would disagree on whether, uh, say, our war in Afghanistan or Iran was a good or a bad thing. Oh, um, good whether bad, or bad, that's not different, yeah. Well, no, well, but that's the point. Whether or not uh, we were on the side of God uh, during the World War II or in World War I, or someone else was on that side. There'd be a whole world. And that comes into to the basic question, the philosophies of those people that espouse the value system, is you don't have ethics if you don't have a value system. But, okay, let's let's take some phone calls. 
Maria on line one has a question for you, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, uh, hello, what is that, Elder Maria? and Dr. Hawkins. I feel so honored to speak with you. I'm like a kid in the candy store. Well, I wonderful. We're glad read, to have you. Uh, I grabbed and read um, your two books, Power versus Force, twice, and the Eye of the Eye. And uh, in one of your chapters, you say that a thorough... Um, as the absorption of the material in this book can raise the individual by an average of 35 points. And also, the humanity was below 200, and it jumped uh, uh, to 207 in, uh, in the 80s. That's my, correct. Yeah, my question is, did we as, as a whole, as humanity, are... Um, uh, growing towards that uh, and surpassed at the moment the 207 and also what is your um, point of view asking, regarding uh, the uh, uh, power uh, in the in the present and how can we use that you're giving me a talk instead of asking me a question no no she did she what wanted to question? know has humanity overall increased since the 80s are we still scoring 207 yes. or have we gone down or up it's gone it's gone up Okay, so that was part one. Part okay. two, Maria, of your question was? How can we use uh, the power of the present uh, consciously? And I, I would like to hear Dr. Hawkins' uh, perspective. Yes, well, the rule is to be as loving, uh, as loving as possible towards all that exists and all of its expression. To be unconditionally loving, and that raises and elevates the consciousness level of all of mankind. Yes. Okay, and um, uh, do, uh, once we reach a certain level of calibration in our lifetime, is there um, we we are steady at that level, or we can go lower and higher? One can go higher and can go lower. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very right. much. Thanks for calling, Maria. We have a question out of the chat room. I'll give to you now, Doctor Hawkins. This uh, question says. Um, who is this from? Let me see if I can see who this is from. BGS. In Dr. Hawkins' book, he states most people stay at the same conscious level and it is difficult to move up. How should she go about becoming more conscious? <coughs> there are all the traditional spiritual pathways, and all one has to do is pursue any one of them which seems the most appealing to you. And then you could check it with kinesiology to see if that is a good pathway for you. Okay, let's let's go to Taylor on line two out of uh, California. Taylor, welcome to Provocative Enlightenment. Your question. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Hawkins. Hello. Uh, my question is, if one knows the truth of reality, is it of greater service to make this known to others whenever possible or is it of greater service to be silent and allow others their own freedom of karmic unfoldment? That's a good question. Dr. Hawking. I don't get what the question really is. Well... If you're of an advanced level of consciousness, should you let the world know about that? That was your first part of your question. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. How would one know that one is of an advanced level of consciousness? Uh, by virtue of the innate revelation. By virtue of what? The innate revelation. <laughs> yeah, it's innately revealed to you that you're of a high level of consciousness. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying if the if the truth of reality is revealed to you. Yes. Is, is it of greater service to make this known to others? Via, via verbal communication or written communication, or is it of greater service to allow them the karmic freedom to discover it on their own, so to speak? Well, first of all, one would have a self-diagnosis to, to begin with is questionable. The people that have uh, contacted me that, you know, claimed that they had reached high levels of consciousness and calibrated a thousand were all delusional, frankly. Mm-hmm. So the answer, uh, 
Dr. Hawkins, uh, for Taylor, is that uh, come right back to the basics, uh, serve your fellow man in some way that uh, assists them, and uh, get on with life. Is that it? There you are. That's got it. That's it. <laughs> be as Thanks for the call. Be as unconditionally you. loving towards all of life. There we go. Thanks yeah, for the call. In all its expressions. Yes. All right, let's uh, let's talk to Emily on line three. Emily, welcome Hi. to Provocative Enlightenment. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, and you? Uh, I'm not doing too good. What are you all talking about collective consciousness? What do you mean by that? The, uh, Carl collective, Jung. The collective, Go ahead, I'm sorry. The, the collective wisdom of mankind. Well, I need some. I have been, uh, like, people take advantage of me. What's wrong with me? You know, I've been, I don't, you know, I don't know how to deal with people. I've been beaten, raped, molested, and everything else. And people have taken money from me, and I'm not very smart in that area. Well, you need somebody to protect your best interest when it comes to money and discuss it with them to make sure that it is in your best interest. No. In other words, your judgment about other humans is not too uh, not too. No, accurate. I used to think everybody was uh, all nice. You know, nobody would cheat anybody or anything else like that. So I live in a, a delusional world. Yes, that's true. So <laughs> that's true. Do what? Right. So you somebody. need you need a protector. You need somebody to check things back and forth with. And I sure do. You know, everybody says, oh, they just say pray. I said, I pray? How, what am, how am I supposed to pray? Anyway, yeah. it sounds like you need a mentor. You need somebody to consult with about judgments yeah, in your who life. Would I do? Who, and especially about financial advice. Yeah, well, who would I go to? You live in Louisiana, Emily? Yeah. Yeah. You uh, go to church? Well, I just stopped going, yes. Okay, you find yourself a minister, mm -hmm. uh, or you find yourself uh, a health care professional that uh, can see you on a, on a pro bono basis. basis. Okay. And, and uh, you sit down with them. And okay. And you let them assist you in guiding uh, some of the, you know, learning from some of the things that have happened in the past so that you create a preventative skill a life skill to deal with the kinds of judgments that you were explaining. Uh, perhaps you vary. Yeah, because I gave about fifty thousand dollars away. Well, but what you need, as Dr. Hawkins says, is you, not so much a protector, but protector is a good word. Is you need you need someone to you know hold your hand and and walk you through just some basics, do do some counseling. But um, you know, I do believe that you're best served. Uh, Prayer is a is a solid way, but it is not the only way. Uh -huh. And sometimes we can just be lost in our prayer. So find yourself a minister, uh, and there there are a number of ministers that, from all faiths that can assist you with this. They do pastoral counseling, or find uh -huh. yourself, like I say, a local counselor. We appreciate you calling, Emily. Well, thank you call you. back again. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Doctor Hawkins. Yeah. <clears throat> You get to play doctor today. How about that? Uh, <laughs> yes, well, you needs, know, that lady needs a mentor. Yeah, that's yeah. that's well, it, it, we can all use a mentor. God bless. Yeah. And, you yeah. know. Okay, uh, I, I've got to ask you, I mean, you are the man that does the calibration. And so, you know, any of us that have been paying any attention to the news, you know, we watch all these polls that are taken, you know, on all of the hot political questions of the day. And I do think there is some truth to the notion, Neil Donald Walsh, although he and I disagree on value systems per se, I do think there is some truth to the fact that, uh, you know, we our, our spirituality is expressed often in our politics, uh, how we become involved. So uh, with that bias, and you go ahead and tell me I'm all wet because I do have a great deal of reverence for your opinion on this, uh, I have to ask this one. We just had a sweeping health care change. Clear the House of Representatives signed into law just uh, before we went on the air. 
In your book on page 73, you state, quote, We may observe how throughout history society has tried to treat social problems by legislative action, warfare, market manipulation, laws, and prohibitions, all manifestations of force, only to see these problems persist or recur despite the treatment. Given this definition, what is your take on the new 2,700-page health care bill that became law today? <coughs> I don't blame you for coughing, um, by the way. It, it seems to be a mixed bag of uh, hope, dreams, political maneuvering. Uh, what is the name of the bill again, the health care? Uh, what is it again? Yeah, it, it is the, it's a 2,700-page health care bill. What is okay, the let, let me calibrate it right now. Okay, good. Let's uh, I have do permission that. to calibrate this health care bill. Resist. Yeah, it calibrates over 200. Resist. So it's good. It calibrates, wait a minute, I didn't get an answer yet. It calibrates oh, okay. over 190, 195. 190. It calibrates at 190. All right, so it's not. This is a force. So, <clears throat> so first, of all, first of all, it's a misnomer. They call it a health care bill, and it's not a health care bill, it's a health care financing bill. Right. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with health care. It has right. to do with financing. Right. I, and, and, you know, and I we, we would calibrate lower than that on my personal scale, but I don't trust my objectivity, so I'm really glad to <laughs> to, to, to hear that. But, all right, uh, what, what, what would you say if someone asked you, uh, is your bottom line message to what your books are all about? And we've got... Two and a half minutes, so take a minute and a half of that and, and let us know, what is the bottom line message? How can we all experience a better life? What is it you're trying to tell us? Well, the, the general rule, which I repeat often, is um, to be as loving as you can be and cordial and uplifting to all of life and all of its expression. That means as you walk through the woods, you bless and love the trees, the grass, the bugs, the birds, the animals, the dogs, and the people near, near you. You you dedicate your life to the uplifting uh, of uh, mankind and the alleviation of suffering. And you pray for the enlightenment of mankind. So by your prayers, by your presence, by your intention. So our calibrated level of consciousness is really set by our our intention. So if our intention, I say, goodwill towards all that exists, goodwill towards all that exists, Uh, goodwill towards all that exists, you know, and then you ask for God's blessing and guidance. Mm -hmm. Of course, like you say, in the past, that's what people thought they were doing when they followed Hitler. They thought they were following uh, they were committing, you know, allegiance to a great leader, and we see it over and over again with one dictator after another. And they rule by um, getting the allegiance of the naive populace. So the populace can't tell the difference between good and evil. And uh, if they um, used kinesiology, uh, they would have found out that Hitler is not the first per- best person to follow, or Chairman Mao. All right, sir. Now, tell everybody your website, how they can contact you in 15 seconds or less. www.veritaspub.com Our email is info at veritas, V-E-R-I-T-A-S, pub.com. All right, we've got to be out of here. I want to thank you for being here. As I paraphrase every week, uh... Above all else, to thine own self be true. Be sure you check out Dr. David Hawking's books and his website. And I hope to hear, I hope you're here with us next week. Same time.